It's always good to see everybody here. I want to welcome once again our visitors that we have. If you have any questions about Monte Vista, if you have questions about God or His Son or the Bible, we'd love to sit down and have a Bible study with you and talk about whatever spiritual need that you have right now. And if you've got your Bible handy, then open up to the book of Jonah. We're going to be in the book of Jonah. That's in the Old Testament amongst the minor prophets. Book of Jonah. You all have known me long enough to know that when the schedule for Bible class says Jonah in one class, you know I'm not going to be able to do that. So what I've decided to do is begin talking about Jonah during this worship period, and then we'll pick up where we leave off in the Bible class. Although I have two different objectives for each of these studies. In this, uh, in this hour of study, what I want to look at primarily is Jonah himself and the contrast between Jonah's heart and the mercy that God shows, not just to the Ninevites at the end of the book, but the mercy that God shows throughout the book of Jonah. And then when we meet together for our Bible class period, we'll look more specifically at some of the background, some of the history, the context of Jonah. We'll look at the sailors in chapter 1. We will look a little bit more at the Ninevites themselves in chapter 3. So our Bible class period is going to be more of the detail. I just want to look at the big picture of Jonah's heart contrasted with God's heart of mercy while we're studying together right now. Most of us are probably aware of the story of Jonah, but let's begin here in chapter 1 verse 1. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. Now, I like that God acknowledges that Nineveh is a great city. I don't think he's being sarcastic there. I think he is acknowledging that for that time period, you have a very advanced civilization and a great many people who have come together as a community. And God cares about them. Even though the Ninevites, being the people in the capital of the Assyrian kingdom, even though these people have been known for their cruelty, have been known for their idolatry, have been known for their rampant sin, this is a community of people that is nevertheless part of God's creation. And He cares about them. And I think maybe a practical observation then is, no matter how deep into sin humanity can go, we are still God's creatures. We still have the potential to turn away from sin. As long as breath is passing between our lips, God has not yet given up on humanity, at least en masse. But Jonah, in verse 3, rose up to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. So he went down to Joppa, found a ship which is going to Tarshish, paid the fare, and went down into into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. And I love the way that the writer puts it. And by the way, we'll talk in Bible class of, was this Jonah writing his own book, or was this somebody else commenting on Jonah uh, Jonah after the, the fact? We'll talk about that in our class period. But it is interesting here that when God sees an opportunity for mercy and compassion, Jonah sees an opportunity to run away and escape. And the kids and I were talking about this while we were studying for class. It's not just that that Jonah disobeys God. It's that he disobeys God to the utmost. This is as extreme an act of disobedience as Jonah could possibly have displayed Tarshish being the complete opposite direction across the Mediterranean Sea from where Nineveh was. So when God says, go this way, Jonah's response is, no, I'm going to go the opposite way, and I'm going to go as far away as possible. Tarshish was just about as far away on the map as Jonah could go, as far away from Nineveh as he knew he could go. And look at the way the verse puts it there. It's not just that he was fleeing from his responsibilities. It's not just that he was running away from the Ninevites. He was fleeing from the presence of the Lord. 
When we shirk our responsibilities as God's people, we are not just fleeing from each other. We're not just fleeing from a charitable opportunity. We're not just fleeing from a worship service. We're not just letting our Bibles collect dust on the bookshelf. When we shirk our responsibilities as God's people, we are actually fleeing from the presence of God. That's the real issue. That's at the heart of the matter. Is God is a God of mercy and God is a God of kindness and compassion and love and forgiveness. And Jonah, Jonah's heart is too deep. It is buried under layers of bitterness and cynicism, buried under layers of resentment toward the Assyrians for decades of aggression he doesn't want to save the Ninevites. The Ninevites represent everything that's wrong in the world, at least in his mind. They were the big kids on the block. They were the bullies of the ancient world. They tore people apart limb from limb and chopped their heads off and skinned them alive. Jonah didn't want to help the Ninevites. He wanted to see them utterly destroyed. The very opposite of compassion and mercy. So as Jonah is going along on the sea, a great storm comes up. And it threatens the lives of every single person on that boat. Not just Jonah, but everybody else on that boat. And through the course of a few hurried and harried conversations, the sailors discover who is at fault. This man, Jonah, is running away from a responsibility that his God has given to him. And even idolaters can recognize there's a problem with that. Even idolaters can recognize that when you run away from the power of your God, there's going to be a consequence. And they are being caught up in that consequence as collateral damage. Now, Jonah tells him to throw me off the side of the boat because you know what? The God I'm dealing with, this is a God, you don't mess with Him. He's got power beyond your comprehension. You better just throw me off the side of the ship now to save your own lives. And these idolaters, these people, we don't know a lot about them, but these are not believers in God, at least at this point. Even they have enough sense to know if we can avoid throwing someone off the end of the boat, then we're going to do that. They've got enough of a moral compass to recognize that. But he persuades them in the end, and they do throw him off the side of the boat. We'll talk about those sailors in the Bible class period, because they, they really end up being a very interesting set of characters. But let's look again at God's mercy. God doesn't just want to show mercy to the Ninevites. Here he is showing mercy also to these sailors. People who up to that point did not know who the God of Israel was had never heard of him, never worshipped him, never seen his power displayed. And now these are believers. Because the first thing that they do when they realize that they've reached safety is they offer sacrifices and make vows to the God of Israel. What seemed at first to be a life-threatening situation ended up saving the spiritual lives of these sailors. God's eagerness to show mercy is so astounding. That's the main point of the book of Jonah. That's the main point of this book. That God wants to show mercy. Not just to His hand-selected few in Israel, but God wants to show mercy to Ninevites, Assyrians. God wants to show mercy to sailors, pagans, idolaters who had never known Him before. God wants to show mercy. Now, for three days and three nights, Jonah was in the belly of a great sea beast of some kind. We'll talk about the, uh, the Hebrew word daggadal in, in our Bible class because there's a little more detail there. Is it a whale or is it a fish? We'll save that conversation for when we get a little bit more detailed with it. But for three days and three nights, Jonah is left to ponder his life. You know, it's like we, we all have those like pivotal moments in life, right? Where you've got to sit and think about your life choices. I don't think any of us, though, have had to think about those life choices from inside of a sea beast. You know, when you're like inside the gut of a giant sea creature and you have to think about, you know, what led me to this point, <laughs> right? 
what led me to this point? And, I, and I'm sure like you're sitting there, cramped quarters, probably the word viscous comes to mind. But what's he doing inside of that creature? He's praying. He's praying. But look at what he prays here. Pick up here in chapter 2. And notice here in chapter 2, verse 2. And he said, I called out of my distress to the Lord, and He answered me. I cried for help from the depth of the sea. Thou didst hear my voice. For Thou hast cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the current engulfed me. All Thy breakers and billows passed over me. So I said, I have been expelled from Thy sight. Nevertheless, I will look again toward Thy holy temple. Water encompassed me to the point of death. The great deep engulfed me. Weeds were wrapped around my head. I descended to the roots of the mountains. The earth with its bars was around me forever. But Thou hast brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. We talk about people hitting rock bottom. That's what he's saying here. I mean, in, in such powerful language... I hit rock bottom. I, I, had, I had seaweed wrapped around me. I felt the sea engulf me. I was getting deeper and deeper. I was sinking. I had to hit rock bottom. Maybe the, the, the secondary theme to Jonah's book. Right? And this the, the point that I'm getting at this morning is, yes, God's compassion. That's the primary point of Jonah is God is merciful. But maybe the secondary point of the book is for us to look in the mirror at ourselves and contrast God's mercy with human tendency toward bitterness and stubbornness. It took hitting rock bottom for Jonah to have this realization. I mean, you could say almost literally. I'm not saying that he literally had to hit rock at the bottom of the ocean. I mean, not, so not literally, but... Uh, almost literally, <laughs> all but literally, he had to hit rock bottom before he came to this realization. That's how hard his heart was. That's how stubborn of a man he was. You know, think about maybe in your own life, the times that you have had to hit rock bottom as well, where you really had to experience life in its grit and its grime to finally make the realization that you need to soften up a little bit and start showing some more love to people. Think about the times in your life where you have been brought to such utter and extreme desperation that your only choice left was to finally open your heart up to God. That's what it took. And look at the very next phrase in verse 7. While I was fainting away, I remember the Lord. To me, that's the most telling thing that Jonah says in this prayer. If you don't have a highlighter or something, or get a pencil or highlight this, whatever, that right there is the most telling statement in Jonah's prayer. Because we know that God is merciful. That's not news to us. But right here, while I was fainting away, I remember the Lord. It took him that moment of fainting away. Only while I was fainting, I didn't remember the Lord beforehand. I didn't remember the Lord a year ago. I didn't remember the Lord when life was fine. I didn't remember the Lord when I was in safety, when I was young, when I was healthy. I didn't remember the Lord when I had money in the bank. I didn't remember the Lord when I loved my job. I didn't remember the Lord before the doctor gave me bad news. I didn't remember the Lord when the church was doing really well. I didn't remember... Like, I didn't remember the Lord then... It took me to where I was fainting away. And finally, while I was fainting away, finally, when I had no other options left, finally, when I was feeling myself dying, okay, well, then I remembered the Lord. And for most people, that's just how stubborn we are, isn't it? It takes that for us to Finally, remember the Lord. Come on, Jonah. Really, come on, Ryan. Because I look at Jonah and I see myself looking, at, looking out at me from the mirror. 
I remember the Lord, and my prayer came to thee into thy holy temple. Verse 8, those who regard vain idols forsake their faithfulness, but I will sacrifice to thee. You know, it's interesting, isn't it? Jonah almost has like this tone of judgment still. People who worship vain idols. Well, hold on a second, buddy. You, you, just, you just got outshone by a bunch of vain idolaters on that ship. And, and you're, about, you're about to be outshone by, by people in the six figures in Nineveh. Vain idolaters. I don't know. Watch out, Jonah. Our language betrays us, doesn't it? Our language gives us away. Those who regard vain idols forsake their faithfulness, but I will sacrifice to thee with the voice of thanksgiving. That which I have vowed I will pay, salvation is from the Lord. Now, it took a lot for him to get to that moment of realization. But you read the rest of the story. Because if Jonah had ended right there, we would have gone, wow, what a story of redemption. But unfortunately for Jonah, the story doesn't end right there. <laughs> it keeps going. It's easy when we're desperate to turn to the Lord. When you have no other options. When nothing else is working for you. When you're stuck in the belly of a great sea beast. Yeah! It's easy to turn to the Lord when you're desperate. But what's the rest of your life going to say about you? And I love the way the book of Jonah ends, by the way. You know, how, you know the story. You know how it ends. But I love how the book of Jonah ends on this question mark, right? God just kind of tells Jonah, I'm a merciful God. And that's it. And we don't find out what happens to Jonah. We don't find out Jonah's response. We don't find out if Jonah changed his heart ever. We're just left with God making a final statement. And that's it. I don't know what ever happened to Jonah. How the rest of his life turned out. His heart was still hard, even up to the point of that gourd, that plant growing over him and dying. I don't know what happened to Jonah. He's just one of those question marks in the Bible. But I will say this, if he did write the book, pretty strong indication if you wrote this book from this perspective, you're Jonah, probably you, ch you had a change of heart at some point. Let's go on here. Let's go on here. So chapter 3, we'll look at the Ninevites more closely in Bible class, but just the big picture of it here is while, while Jonah is preaching to them a message that he kind of hopes deep down inside, maybe not quite deep down inside, right on the surface level, is going to happen. God's going to destroy all y'all. See, Tennessee. God's going to destroy all y'all and bring this city to a complete and utter destruction. That, that's probably an easy sermon for Jonah to preach because that's kind of what he wants to have happen. That, that's easy preaching for him. Isn't it interesting though, the preaching that probably felt kind of like self-gratifying to Jonah, that's exactly the kind of preaching that God wanted to use to bring about a change of heart for the Ninevites. Jonah's probably rubbing grit in their eyes and having a good time about it, Oh, Nineveh, mighty Nineveh, all your monuments and your walls and your great accomplishments and all these people, God's going to destroy everything. Every tower and every wall and every building and every idol, all of it torn down and destroyed utterly by the Lord. He's probably kind of enjoying that preaching because it's really self-gratifying for him to come in there, this lone wolf, and be a judge of everybody. But the thing that's kind of self-gratifying for Jonah is the instrument that God is trying to use to not destroy Nineveh. God doesn't want Nineveh destroyed. And there's such a contrast there. When God saw their deeds in verse 10, that they turned from their wicked ways, then God relented concerning the calamity which He had declared He would bring upon them, and He did not do it. Now let's think about that a little bit. We're talking about the mercy of God, right? That's this great theme in the book of Jonah. Yes, God is extremely merciful. Merciful and compassionate beyond all comprehension. But was God ready to pull the trigger if they hadn't repented? Oh yeah. This was not an empty threat. We need to, we need to give that some, some of our attention. That this was not an empty threat on God's part. He wasn't bluffing. 
He wasn't pretending. This wasn't, a, this wasn't some kind of like gamble with God. It says that he relented concerning the calamity which he had declared. The, the fact that he would relent from it means that he was ready to do it. His finger was on the trigger, so to speak. The calamity was going to come. And it's just important to acknowledge that, yes, God is merciful, but God is also a just God. And if God doesn't see fruits of repentance, there will be judgment. He has to see the fruit of repentance. He has to see a life that is changed. He is not just boasting in some empty, vain way. Think about that. Hell is not an empty threat. There will be darkness there and weeping and gnashing of teeth is not an empty threat. Where the worm does not die is not an empty threat. A lake of fire and brimstone that burns for all eternity is not an empty threat. The earth and its works destroyed with intense heat is not an empty threat. Depart from me, I know you not, is not an empty threat. These are not empty threats that God is throwing out there. They are very real judgments. And it was that that way with Nineveh. God's merciful, but He needed to see a change in Nineveh. He needed to see the change. So when you get into chapter 4 now, it displeased Jonah, and he became angry. God's mercy displeased him. Now, I know with set of a hypothetical situation, right? I know there's, there's a lot of holes in this, right? But, you know, let's say we get there on the judgment day, okay? And we're all standing before God on the judgment day, and He's on the, you know, the, the seat of judgment, and, and we're looking around expecting ourselves to, to be basically first in line, right? I did everything right. I, I, I did the baptism thing, and I did the church thing, and, and I, did, I, I didn't do the drinking, and, I, and, you know, and I, I didn't use any swear words except when I was really mad that one time I hit myself with a hammer. You know, I did, the, I did all the right stuff. We, we kind of expect, like, well, I should be first in line, basically, right? And then we look around and realize, wait a minute, there's all these people I wasn't expecting to be here. Hold on a second. I wasn't, I wasn't expecting that guy to be here. Her? Really, God? Really? Her? Are we going to be upset by God's grace? That's the question I'm really asking. Is Are we going to be upset by God's grace? Is it going to bother us when we find out that grace really is as vast and immeasurable as God has promised? And I know it's a narrow way. I understand that. Jesus Himself said that. Narrow is the way, and few are those who walk that narrow way. I get that. I understand that. I understand that. But even on a narrow way, I think think we are going to be really surprised on the judgment day by just how many people there's going to be who are saved. And and maybe we'll kind of think, oh, well, I put all that effort in. I put all that work in. I didn't realize it would be so easy. You mean grace really is just grace? It really is unmerited? You mean there's all these people that I would not have deemed to be deserving who ended up going to heaven? Wow. I I shouldn't have worked so hard. I shouldn't have worked so hard. And I guess maybe when you read the book of Jonah, a good question to ask yourself is, does God's mercy offend you? That was Jonah's response. God showed mercy to people by the hundreds of thousands and that offended Jonah. So then we have as we bring the the story to a close. He's sitting there basically up on a hill just kind of watching, hoping. Maybe, you know how it is when, you're, when your team is down by three touchdowns, it's the fourth quarter, and you think, well, okay, well, they could scoop up a fumble for a score, and then they could do two onside kicks, and maybe they'll still win. The, you, know, right? you know when you're like desperation mode, like there's still two minutes on the clock, they can win it. Maybe Jonah's sitting on the top of the hill like thinking, maybe God's just, he's just joshing me, right? He's just joking with me. Maybe he'll still destroy Nineveh. Maybe Nineveh's repentance was, it was all in pretense. It, it was all for show. 
I'm going to sit here on the top of the hill and just kind of watch what happens. And it's hot out. So what does God do for Jonah? He grants that this mighty bush will grow over him, right? This, this beautiful, luxuriant plant. And it says there in verse 5, He made a shelter for himself, sat under it in the shade until he could see what would happen in the city. So the Lord appointed a plant and it grew over Jonah to be a shade over his head to deliver him from his discomfort. And Jonah was, New American Standard says, extremely happy about the plant. Now I like this. Jonah makes a little shelter for himself, but what God can do for you is always going to be better than what you can do for yourself. Think about that. That is not a coincidence there. He made a shelter for himself and sat under it, but then God said, look what I can do. You've crafted a little shelter for yourself. You have no idea what I'm capable of. Jonah's ability to show mercy was a tiny little rickety shack. He found some sticks like Eeyore's house, right? You know how Eeyore always put, it, put together a house in Winnie the Pooh stories? There's always like sticks and stuff. He made himself a little shack, a little nothing, a little ram shackle lean to, and God says, watch what I can do. That's true of mercy and forgiveness. It's true of grace our idea of mercy is a little tiny ramshackle lean-to. God's idea of mercy is a beautiful plant that springs forth from the ground instantaneously. And he was extremely happy. That guy's, you know, man of extreme emotions, isn't he? <laughs> extremely happy. Now, he's not exaggerating here. If Jonah wrote this book... He knows how he felt about it. He knows how he felt about it. Extremely happy about a plant. Shade. Extremely happy. But Nineveh's mercy didn't make him extremely happy. Now in the course of time it says there, in verses 7 and 8, that a worm came and attacked the plant. When the sun came up, God appointed a scorching east wind, and the sun beat down on Jonah's head so that he became faint and begged with all his soul to die, saying, Death is better to me than life. Again, a man of just extremes. Wild, swinging extremes. And here's the lesson for Jonah. And here's the lesson for us. God said to Jonah in verse 9, Do you have good reason to be angry about the plant? I think he also may be inferring is, did you have a good reason to be extremely happy about the plant? It, it, it's a plant. It's shade. Temper your emotions, right? Temper your emotions. Did you have a good reason to be angry about the plant? And Jonah, probably doing his best toddler impression, said, I have good reason to be angry, even to death. me, me, me. That's probably what he... He, he didn't write that because the Hebrew translation, it, it doesn't work, you know, from Hebrew into English. But I have good reason to be angry. <laughs> That's probably what it sounded like. Jonah's acting like a baby here. He's acting like a baby. So you had compassion on the plant, the Lord says in verse 10. You had compassion, uh, compassion on the plant for which you did not work. You had no, there was no physical investment in the plant. You didn't water it, you didn't plant it, you didn't grow it. There was no physical investment in the plant. It was just a plant that sprung forth and gave you shade. You didn't work for it. You didn't cause it to grow, which came overnight and perished overnight. Easy come, easy go, right? Should I not have compassion, in verse 11, on Nineveh? the great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know the difference between their right hand and their left hand as well as many animals? Three more applications of God's mercy. And the lesson is yours. First, God is merciful to Jonah because he has given this man opportunity after opportunity after opportunity to learn something and do the right thing. And that is itself an act of mercy. The patience that parents show to their children, the fact that we, that, that we will live with our children all these years, that we'll put up with them patiently. 
that we will discipline them consistently, day in and day out, sometimes disciplining them for the same mistakes they made yesterday and the day before and the day before that, that we would be so patient is itself an act of mercy. Because has God given up on Jonah yet? No. The fact that God keeps reaching out to Jonah means He has not given up on him. That there's still something left inside of Jonah that God says, man, get it. Come on, Jonah. Get it. Come on, man. Mercy to Jonah by trying to teach him lessons, by giving him opportunities to change and giving him opportunities to learn. That is mercy. Mercy to animals. That's a point we don't always bring out in this story. You know, he says there's 120,000 persons, or more, that is, in Nineveh. But you know, there's also a lot of animals there as well. And I like that. That's just, it's a little detail there that we sometimes miss. That yeah, there's livestock, there's horses, there's that sort of thing. In the destruction of Nineveh, all these animals would have been destroyed as well. Now, it's not like, it's, not like it's, a, it's a moral issue necessarily, because God was willing to destroy the animals in the flood. So it's not necessarily a moral issue with God, but that God has such compassion that He would even look at the animals in Nineveh and extend compassion and mercy to them. I mean, that just shows how compassionate God really is. But then the people. 120,000 people plus. Now, is He saying there are 120,000 people total? and all of them are so ignorant of truth and righteousness and right and wrong that they don't even know their right hand from their left. That's one interpretation, right? The one interpretation there is these people are so ignorant of truth and error that they don't even know the difference between right and left. Why should I judge people like that when they've just not had the opportunity? They've never heard of me until now. They've never known me until now. They don't know their right hand from their left hand. How can I judge people who are so ignorant of truth? And I think it's a good application there. It's a good application to think about. That's how deep God's mercy is. Is He looks not just what you know, but what you could or could not have ever known. And until that point, God says, I mean, they couldn't know the difference between right and wrong because they don't even know the difference between their right hand and their left. But it's also possible that what he's saying is there's 120,000 people who are children in there. Children who don't know the difference between their right hand and their left hand. And if that's true, if there are 120,000 children, then you're looking at more like 400,000 people altogether. Either way, either way, God is saying, you're getting yourself all bent out of shape over a plant? And you're mad at me for showing mercy to hundreds of thousands of people? Come on, Jonah. Come on, Ryan. Come on, everybody. God's grace and His mercy are so immeasurable and so deep and so beautiful. Let's let God be God and let's handle the part that's been given to us, which is to obey Him with all of our hearts. And if you're not a Christian here this morning, you have an opportunity right now. Whatever spiritual need you have, whether it's to become a Christian, to confess Jesus Christ as Lord, and to be baptized in His name, or if you are a Christian and you've had a hard heart just like Jonah, we've got an opportunity either way right now to make a change in your life. So whatever need you have, please let it be known by coming forward as we stand.